So who are you? Simon Crosby. I'm the CTO for Data Center and Cloud at Citrix Systems. Very cool. And uh, most pe most consumers probably have no idea what Citrix does, uh, but you're really one of the arms dealers underneath these new cloud data centers, right? Well, it's surprising actually. The people who I meet on the street who do know who Citrix are, are people yeah, like nurses and doctors' assistants and so on, people who access applications on their desktop every day. When they click on that logo, up pops this thing, it says Citrix. Right. So there's a ton of them who actually do know. They generally say, oh, Citrix, I've heard of you. And then you say, well, is it a little icon that pops up when you launch your apps? They say, oh, yeah, that's it. So 100 million users every day get their applications from Citrix. Wow. That's it's, pretty crazy. It's large. And, and uh, people probably don't know the GoToMeeting, go to my PC, yeah. go to Sys. That's all Citrix, too. That's another 100 million sessions a year. Very cool. T lay out what's happening in cloud, you know, because there's a lot of noise right now. There's VMware, there's Amazon, there's Rackspace, there's Citrix. Right. I explain, tell me, lay out the landscape of, of what's all, going on. Cloud is, cloud's an emerging, it's emergence of, of basically all the stuff we did in the year 2000. Remember that ASP yeah. stuff we talked about? Well, there's a lot of SaaS out there, right? So cloud broadly you can divide into SaaS, the sort of Salesforce.com things, then Infrastructure as a service, uh, which Amazon EC2, Amazon Web Services, would be the quintessential service provider offering there. And then emerging, at some point in the future, platform as a service, which is a way to write your apps the next time around so that they can run in a scalable way on this cloud. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, the industry conversation tends to be driven from those two ends, from SaaS and from infrastructure as a service. And from the enterprise perspective, everybody who's been doing server virtualization is now told that they're also doing cloud. That is, that's the next stretch for them, right? They're going to now build their data center from being just server virtualization, server consolidation into a cloud. And, uh, and that's great. Uh, we like that. Um, but in general, when people want to get to cloud, they have to think about all of those things. And in fact, they have to think about more. Enterprises live on apps. Yeah. Okay. And so apps and desktops for their end users. That's always been true. I worked at Visual Basic Programmers Journal, right? And those right. guys in the 90s wrote right. apps for, to run a little work group exactly. thing and you know some, some custom code for a small number of people working in an enterprise. Right, so those apps are Windows apps, if they run on your desktop or on a Windows server. They're enterprise web apps, increasingly. And then they're SaaS, so cloud, for Citrix, is not just how do we take ServerVert and make it into something like Super ServerVert, which is more of a VMware story. It's how do we enable the future enterprise infrastructure to be delivered as a service to end users. In other words, end users get self-service for their applications and their desktops on whatever device they want to use. Yeah. As well as how do I deliver applications from the cloud that are hosted someplace else securely to my customers or my end users as well as how does IT turn itself into a self-service fabric that enables business groups to right. go off and get hold of infrastructure to develop applications and run them themselves. So it's a very broad story. And implicit in that is that virtualization is a handy technology, yeah. uh, but that isn't what it's about. Virtualization is an enabler, but it's not, uh, not nearly sufficient. Um, and so a story based in virtualization, which Veeam has done a very good job of selling, is, is in my view, woefully inadequate. Okay, why? Well, actually, virtualization, well, hypervisor style, all it ever does is turn some bits of hardware into an abstract layer. That's fine, you need to do that. And really, to date, I'd say that the virtualization folks have done a reasonably good job for server compute and storage. But really, in the networking area um, is where all the richness is required, particularly if I'm going to use partly enterprise IT, my own facilities, and partly hosted stuff for some SaaS capability. In other words, the enterprise boundary is automatically extending to non-owned facilities, and okay. so the richness comes in the network. That means more enterprises are moving stuff from their data centers, their own data centers, into things like EC2 or, or into Rackspace Cloud, right? Or they're using something like Salesforce for CRM. Yeah. Okay, so the emergence of it's, all of those opportunities in cloud implicitly require that more capabilities will be acquired from the outside by IT or by line of business application owners, and so it is all about how you make the network work. 
And this in is fact, why there's all, all these new companies like Jive and Social Text and Social Cast and well, kind of yes. That is, in general, there's a blurring of the line between the enterprise and the consumer. The consumer, by the way, the consumer use uh, use case or the consumer use experience is far better than the enterprise user experience, and that's driving IT very, very hard. I mean, the emergence of the iPad and Android devices is really hammering at IT departments, and there's this blurring of the line between people bringing their own devices in and the need for enterprise IT to lock everything down and forbid it. That's a huge challenge. IT is also being bashed by, by costs, right? They, sure they are. Running their own data centers is expensive. Right. And, it's extraordinarily expensive. And especially if you're not using those data centers very well, which if you're running right. uh, by the way, this old to... school systems on those right. not in virtualization, you're not using those machines very, very efficiently, right? Yes. But ultimately, if you think about what we're doing here, when we talk about virtualization, we're virtualizing the enterprise itself. Because the enterprise assets will be uh, partly hosted, they'll be partly internal. They may be, the enterprise extends its presence to owned client devices, its own PCs uh, and own laptops, as well as, as the employee's own device. That's bring your own, right? I want to get hold of my apps on my iPad. Yeah. Okay, on my Android device. Or and so we're Google, virtualizing the enterprise. We're on, on your top Google TV at home. Right, right, <laughs> yeah, right, on, right. And so we're virtualizing the enterprise broadly, and um, and so that takes a whole bunch more than just virtualizing the hardware infrastructure, or even just virtualizing the network. You've got to virtualize access to applications. So that requires that you have an ability to virtualize this notion of identity and authorization, and then deliver that to wherever the user happens to need to get access to something as a service. So, so that's sort of what Facebook's doing, right? Uh, well, because well, Facebook, I can get access to my Facebook account through any device. I could sit at that computer right now and get to my Facebook account, right? Sure. But, and and but Facebook's identity is now becoming identity that all sorts of websites are using, right? I click, yes, but the enterprise I doesn't. Tech crunch that's and I right. want to comment on that. That's absolutely right. So, but, so there's the consumer driven notion of identity, yeah. right? There's also Gmail IDs, and, and, yeah. and Open ID is a very important component there. But the enterprise is, is actually using enterprise credential systems, typically AD, Active Directory. And when the enterprise goes out to acquire these services, goes out to salesforce.com, ideally what they'd want to do is take that enterprise credential and just make it work. Right? So for us, cloud, the open cloud platform at Citrix, is about taking those enterprise credentials and simply turning that into a way to self-service provision users out into Salesforce, as well as provide all of the role-based access control behind that. So you only get to do what you're allowed to do, or indeed provide an enterprise class uh, role-based access control so on top be, of Amazon Web Services. You're trying to be the Facebook of enterprises. Uh, Facebook. <laughs> well, it's not quite that actually, because we don't build the community around that. The community, right. in some sense, is di dictated by AD. I'm but, talking about the identity part of Facebook. Well, no. The cool thing is that in Open Cloud Access, which is one of the components of Open Cloud, we have an ability to use Bring Your Own ID. Got it. So if you, as an enterprise, choose to trust Google or Facebook or anybody else and use OpenID, you can have a user show up, present a Facebook credential, and once you have accepted that, you will know that it's authentic from Facebook, say, and then you can access to all your enterprise apps. Wow. So all of that is there, for sure. So bring your own ID, but that's a little bit down the path for most enterprises, right? They're mostly, mostly sitting there with uh, typical enterprise credential management system and so on. Yeah, I can so, see so cloud is not virtualization. Cloud is not even virtualization of my own data center. It's essentially a broadening of the enterprise um, ability to acquire external and internal capabilities, make them dynamic, make them elastic, pay for them when they are consumed, and make users get self-service access to them. And so this pervades everything we do at Citrix. We have a very substantial networking portfolio, Netscaler, for example, that runs every single one of the large SaaS uh, plays out there, Google, eBay, the whole works. And Netscaler itself is also available just as software, as a virtual appliance. The interesting thing about that is now we can move our customer from buying hardware to paying for the consumption of our software based on the amount that they use it. Got it. So we're dramatically changing everything we do into a consumption-based form of, uh, of acquiring IT. Yeah. It's a pretty crazy uh, change. Y yesterday I gave a talk and I I showed off uh, this app called Siri, which lets uh, iPhone users, well, uh, buy a, a restaurant table, right, without yes. talking to the restaurant. It's all 
through APIs mm -hmm. and saying every single business is going to do this in, in, the, in the near future. Right? Sure. Does this new world help businesses move toward that where their information, their inventory, their service is all virtual? It does. Like and that? if you're an enterprise, the biggest concern is security. Yeah. Okay. Because the enterprise is uh, forced under regulatory, for regulatory reasons and a whole bunch of other compliance reasons to deliver applications and to, to conduct its business in a secure and auditable way. So this is the challenge. Um, all of those requirements drive enterprise IT to lock everything down, make it inflexible and therefore expensive. And everything that the consumer does is throw away. I can throw away my device at any time and I'm instantly back up with, I mean, if I drop my I'm good, right? Just get another one, plug it in, all the stuff shows up again and we're good. So we're trying to enable that benefit that you get in the consumer world for the enterprise. You can only do that if you can build secure, provably secure access to anything anywhere on top of that infrastructure. And that's a fundamental requirement. So it starts, I mean, in Citric context, virtualizing applications and virtualizing desktops is a major portion of our business. Growing very, very fast. We've virtualized something like three and a half million desktops in the last couple of quarters. And that's really the enterprise buying to the notion that having all these PCs distributed around their, their facilities and also having a large number of their users running around with laptops is the worst thing you could ever do for security. Yeah. Because a vast amount of enterprise state is on those hard disks. Yeah. And if you lose it or it's broken, then, you, then you've lost a lot of state. So what do they want to do? They want to centralize that and they want to deliver the desktop as a service to the user on any device, on an iPad, on an Android device, on a laptop. Yeah. Then there's also a need to do that on a secure client, that's Zen client. It's a client, it's a virtualized enterprise laptop with security built in so that you can securely lock down a corporate desktop, let it out in the wild, and even if you lose it, you're, you're, you're not vulnerable. You've got to be able to, um, you know, you've got to have a hypervisor and that gives you some of the dynamism for the workload. But in general, you've got to be able to deliver that. That means secure access from employees anywhere on the planet to their apps and desktops. It means um, an ability to elastically scale them, an ability to uh, identify people to provide role-based access control and all the policy around that, uh, no matter what it happened to be. And of course, it also works in the SaaS context where the SaaS provider um, simply as delivering apps to consumers. Its customer base is acquiring the app from its hosted facility, from yeah. its cloud. If I'm over at VMware, what, what kind of story are they telling and how is that different from VMware's the story? story is a very simple story. It says uh, server vert delivered you server consolidation benefits, which were it was real money uh, very quickly, turned into virtual infrastructure, which is a more agile, more responsive business in which the, the assets of the enterprise are more uh, easily adaptable to a changing business climate, turns into cloud, which is different business groups get self-service access to virtualized IT resources, yeah. okay, which is, hey, I need a new server, let me go to the self-service web, web portal and I can drop in a new workload. It comes up from a hypervisor through all those layers, but it's very much infrastructure as a service based. Um, and then it's Really, that, to the extent that they're embracing the external resources, they're talking about service providers adopting VMware to run VMware infrastructure for the customer in off-prem. Yeah. Which is uh, actually, in my view, a waste of time. Why? Um, it's a factor of 10 to expensive for anybody to do it. Moreover, if you're a service provider and you want to offer VMware as a service hosted service play, it's extraordinarily expensive to yeah. do it. Everybody else can do it, and they will offer exactly the same thing. So you're instantly paying a lot to be a commodity. Yeah, and that's um, partly why Rackspace Cloud uses Citrix, right? So correct. And uh, so uh, in in VMware Open Cloud, it seems interesting, but it's very expensive. Very expensive. Factor of ten more. For this, is what we're getting from the service writers we've been uh, we've been dealing with. Yeah. Um, and so that's a challenge for them. But more importantly, you know, we're not hypervisor agnostic here. I mean, I happen to be the Zen guy. I came yeah. in with Zen Server. But we've worked very closely with Microsoft on Hyper-V. We're absolutely compatible with Hyper-V, and we will run any VM from VMware. If the customer has an investment, the worst thing you can do is say, no, I'm not going to honor that, right? So any hypervisor is a mandate. Um, that is, even if the enterprise has adopted VMware for their core infrastructure, they should be able to adopt their Rackspace cloud for their non-local non, uh, infrastructure, right? right? And any assumption that I have to have VMware here and VMware there just seems to be fundamentally broken. Yeah. 
and uh, certainly the service providers segment agrees with this. The other key thing is that service providers really want to differentiate their offerings. Yeah. One of the reasons that the Rackspace guys wanted to open source everything that they do, uh, and one of the reasons we work at NASA and, and, and about 30 vendors on OpenStack, is that they said that this owning this layer of cloud orchestration stuff, management software really, is not, not strategic. Yeah. And moreover, they differentiate by service and support of their customers. Yeah. And if they try to be a software company, they'll fail. Yeah. Moreover, Amazon you can't is hire. a software company. You, you can't, <laughs> well, yeah, you're against Amazon, but you're uh, in Texas. You can't get enough uh, geeks down there who have built big companies, you know. I mean, I, you would have to open up labs and throw a billion dollars at the problem, right? Right. So, but, but the key and thing is that all these guys... have a billion dollars. <laughs> they don't, but they're probably number two in infrastructure as a service. But Absolutely. if you look at other folks like Carpathia, which is federal cloud, yeah. or uh, SoftLayer, which is SME cloud, they all have their own unique play there, and that's the way we've got to let it be. So, um, you yeah. know, differentiation in that market is absolutely critical to its success. I'm trying to commoditize everybody by saying, hey, everybody gets to sell the same thing called vCloud. That doesn't work for us. Yeah. Do, you, do you see a world where uh, Citrix is going to sell some services direct to enterprises and then Rackspace is going to sell the same services to small businesses? Sort of like how we sell SharePoint today to small businesses, uh, you know, where Microsoft sells SharePoint to a huge enterprise directly. So Citrix, Citrix and its channel sell desktop virtualization and virtual infrastructure capabilities in the private cloud and so on to the enterprise of our, of our traditional go-to-market. That Our commitment there is that everything that we do will be pre-federated. Yeah. That is, we have all of the capabilities in the, in the open cloud stack. We have uh, open cloud bridging, which will simply seamlessly bridge the enterprise network out to any cloud provider you want, extending your layer two network upwards. Um, open Cloud Access, which will extend your AD or your, your enterprise credential management out into any provider of your choice, no matter what infrastructure they're running, and various other capabilities around that, um, really to provide a, a set of tools that allow the enterprise to make the right choice about what runs where. And I think people will take a rational, rational step forward that they'll move non-mission critical things out to the cloud first, things that can scale, things that can take advantage of that scalability and elasticity new projects perhaps yep. and a lot of elastic web type stuff is moving out already to things like a, a, right. like Rackspace um, and then those workloads are subject to federal compliance or you know, other regulations will stay home for a bit yep. or stay in our managed managed uh, you know because you can have your own machines and have that have your own that's right separate thing that one of the funny computer. things about about all of this is that if you look at the colo model you know, where people are quite happy leaving things that are subject to compliance, that basically your protection is a wire cage. Yeah. But um, all of those guys are moving up stack, and that's very interesting. So the former hosters, Rackspace, a former hoster, Carpathia, former hoster, they've moved up stack to the point where they are off you dedicated cloud. Yeah. Right? So it's a private cloud in their facility. By the way, why would you not do that? Because they built the entire infrastructure up for you with all of the granular uh, controls and chargeback and everything else. Yeah. And then they also have, I mean, so in the case of Carpathia, you know, they, they host federal workloads, top secret. So they have chaps on the top with machine guns. Why wouldn't you want the federal government to pay for security for your workloads? Yeah. It absolutely makes sense. Um, if, if you were, uh, you know, planning a speech uh, to uh, a group of CTOs for January and sort of laying out a, uh, an agenda for the year, what, what would it be? What, what, what's happening what do you expect to happen over the next 12 months in, in enterprises and what, what should they pay attention to? The enterprise IT infrastructure is going through profound change. The change that is being driven from the consumer adoption of devices is unbelievably fast. And it's coming for the first time from the top. Because the CEO and everybody with a C title walks in on an iPad and says, make this work. Okay, for yeah. the first time you have a client that doesn't run any of the traditional security stuff. Um, which has to be on the net, has to get access. And that is blowing apart all the IT systems. So it's dramatically uh, increasing cost and increasing complexity. So that's big thrust number one, big trends toward bring your own devices. And that, by the way, can be a real ticket 
for so savings you're saying reductions. A, a, Apple's really disrupting the enterprise that much. Huh? Huge. And then what Citrix does is deliver the entire Windows franchise to any Apple or Android or you know, BlackBerry device, yeah. right? So any Windows app or any desktop, we can deliver it to any device today. Yeah. And um, so today at Citrix, we have what a forty percent of our population of our, our workers bring in their own devices as their primary device. And Citrix really? does not own that device. We simply deliver to it. So delivery two is a big thing, right? Self-service access to your apps and your desktop. And that means IT doesn't have to own or manage that device. Incredible savings. So that's a big one. End user access. The and other one- And the employees get to have the device they want, right? So if they want, it, if they want a Mac, they get a oh, Mac. If they want a great It's an incredibly Dell. sweetheart deal for the enterprise. Here's how it works. Here's my, my way to take on the math. Citrix gives me $2,100, right? On which I get taxed. I go and buy a $3,000 Mac and an iPad, because it's way cool to do demos on an iPad, then the kids steal the first one, I have to go and I buy another one. Yeah. yeah, okay, that's how it works. So it's really, you know, it's up leveled my user experience, and, um, and you know, okay, but that's a huge trend. Um, the other one is that from a, the, the, this, the plain old server virtualization trend is carrying on, and yeah. carrying on very fast. <coughs> Excuse and that's me. where Rackspace really saw a huge growth, the, the Rackspace cloud, and I, I know Amazon gets their 51%, and they're growing really fast. So uh, lots of enterprises are moving from old traditional data centers, virtualizing those if they can, or moving some things out that's to right. the cloud service. That's moving services. them out to clouds. And so if you're going to adopt virtualization or adopt virtual infrastructure, even more cloudy things, private, it turns out that it's easier to do that in a hosted fashion, rather than build it all. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse Sorry. me. Rather than build it all yourself, right? Yeah. Wow. Um, what else? Is, what else is, are you seeing happen? And and what should geeks? What should developers pay attention? Well, to? I think the I think because you're talking to the to the CTOs who are going to buy major systems, or talking yeah. to guys at Rackspace who are going to decide: Are we going to buy VMware for our cloud next year? Are we going to go with Zen, or and we're going with Zen? <laughs> But you're talking to those people. What, what about developers? What should they be? What kinds of skills should they be focusing on? Because what do you see happening to the developer world? So I see profound change. So the adoption of cloud ultimately is a change in the way IT is structured, yeah. and arguably the resistance to cloud, which you hear quite substantially, is mostly a fear of change. Yeah. It's a lack of skill set on the part of IT. So I would certainly encourage everybody who is in IT to acquire those skills. Generally, when I start a talk, I say. Who here has logged on to Amazon EC2, launched VMs, and done something? All right, and that number is increasing, but it's not increasing fast enough. And I do that just just to see the experience. So people need to get their heads around what cloud means and how it will change their jobs, because it is a job issue. Right? It's a skills issue, and CIOs need to need to mandate that. Um, and I think that then the same is true for developers. Yeah. The interesting thing is that if you have a BlackBerry or Android device in your pocket, every single one of those back-end things that run up in the cloud, they're sitting up in some cloud like Amazon EC2. Yeah. And or those, or, Rack, or Rackspace, right. But yeah. fundamentally, they started out there. So Zynga started up there, yeah. Facebook, Twitter, all these guys. They use a large number of those cloud-based resources. And those apps are written very differently. So if you took a traditional enterprise IT workload exchange server and said, hey, I'm going to run it on Amazon Web Services. You know, you'd bang your head on a wall for a while before you figured out how to get it there. Even some of the Citrix software, Zen App, very difficult to get it to run properly there because the infrastructure model isn't rich enough. But what's happened is that the app developers are writing new apps assuming a cloud interface like Amazon Web Services, maybe even just the basics like EC2, S3, and EBS. And so that's profoundly changing the skill set of the app developers. So often CIOs that I talk to, they, um, they discover that they're using cloud services even though they're, you know, they're not supposed to. Oh, absolutely. And you're seeing new, new services like Yammer, you know, not, not uh, these are uh, social services that, that are being brought in the back door by right. employees because they want to use what they have at home. You know, right. They want to use something like Twitter or something like yeah. Facebook. Actually, so I, I heard a fabulous a story um, from a CIO of a very large consulting firm recently. They implemented Yammer internally and cut their email volume by 40%. Yeah. And moreover, he claims that they are now much more up to date with what's going on the front lines of their business. Yeah. There's no layer. I'm hearing those stories yeah. from all of them. You know, Salesforce has those stories yeah. with the new chatter. 
Yammer has them. Uh, Social Cast, I just interviewed Social Cast. Social Text. Yeah. Jive. Jive is right. maybe going public next year. They're they're all uh, seeing these kinds of stories and and are fighting over uh, the, this new field of you know trying to trying to get right. new social systems into uh, enterprises. Right. So it's, it's interesting. But most of them are going in the back door, except for Benioff can go in the front door. But <laughs> yeah, that's right. The, you know, Yammer has to be adopted by somebody who's passionate about it. And, that's right. And but I think I think as that next generation of IT developers come in, they're yeah. going to bring those tools with Absolutely. them, and they're just going to run them. And um, you know, you'll, you'll find that spreading. So um, you know, I, I think the good thing about the platform as a service notion is, in, in general, this is not magic, right? An evolution of the current IT infrastructure building blocks. So whether it's a .NET framework or whether it's PHP or Java, there are, you know, those developer frameworks are there, they're popular, people know how to use them already in the enterprise, and there's a good path forward for them in terms of layering on top of clouds. So. What VMware has done, which is very interesting, is their acquisition of Spring, Spring Source, uh, gives them the access to all those developers, um, and uh, which is fine. That, that gives them a platform play. The interesting thing, as far as I'm concerned, is that there are much, much better ways to run Spring than there are than putting it on VMware, and uh, so you can run it on Gigaspaces or Macar, any one of these other guys who does platform today, it. and it runs, scales elastically, and, and so on. So even the Spring. Uh, spring source capability which has got huge following and open source all good stuff it can be used in many ways but um, that developer base is going to be important what mistakes are you seeing enterprises make when they get into this new world no I think one has to be permissive here um, if, if there is something that is still lingering that should be shot it would be ITIL and uh, ITIL is very popular in Europe not so popular in the US but ITIL is a essentia, an extremely detailed set of specifications for how you can take your IT organization through changes and your, and your IT infrastructure through changes, mostly on the basis of human practice. And so ITIL became the kind of standard way for enterprises to become more rigorous about running their IT environments. But it's extraordinarily detailed, extraordinarily expensive, and very, very labor uh, intensive. And so ITIL actually needs to be banished, in my view. I think it's happening in a de facto, on a de facto basis, just because the people who are more effective are those who are using these tools, and uh, and oh, they're yeah. getting getting the job done much more efficiently, much more cost effectively, and the enterprise is more dynamic. Well, that's what you know. When I visited the New York Times and I visited the R and D department, he said, "Oh yeah, we we just used uh, Amazon. We slid our credit yeah. card and started up some servers and right. did some jobs and got something done. And exactly. we didn't have to ask anybody because it was so cheap and it was on a credit card. That's right. And, yeah, well, now we, and, we can you know, just Rackspace, you have a, yeah. it, I don't know if you've uh, put the Rackspace uh, iPad app up. Yeah. You can spin up servers right from your iPad on your right. couch. You know? <laughs> That's crazy. That's right. Yeah. So, um, and we can add all the enterprise role-based access controls for both of us, right? Yeah. By extending the AD system out of that. So, um, it's incredibly powerful. Look, everybody who's doing server but is calls of their cloud, and I'm, very, I'm inclined to be very permissive there. It's great. We need to move IT forward. And so the, uh, the, biggest, the biggest omission is to not do anything. Yeah. You know, you've, got, you've got to get moving here, and you've got to move the enterprise forward, uh, no matter what size. It's another in, in, interesting emerging category for us. Um, Citrix traditionally delivered applications in the enterprise segment. But what we've seen is a, a fair number of our um, of managed service providers adopting our portfolio to deliver apps or desktops to end users as a service. Sometimes small, just just small regional players, and so you'll find them delivering all of their productivity suites and legal apps to a legal firm, and the legal firm does not have anybody in IT. They just walk in with a device, could be a PC, could be a thin client, and their and their iPad, and hey ho, they get all their all of their apps. And it's all centralized, it's all secure, and so on. So we've probably signed up 650-odd providers in the last year just to do that. Wow. And that's growing very fast. Very cool. How does OpenStack change the world? And so OpenStack changes the world in, in, the, in the sense that... I mean, I work for Axbase, so I'm pushing out OpenStack. You yeah. work for Citrix, and you're, you're so different. No, it's very, very simple. I, I think VMware has a great play. They've done a fabulous job. And their play is, it's all VMware all the way. And our play is not that. It's the exact opposite. Our play is you get to pick the best components of each layer of the stack. And if you wanted to do that, then what would be the right 
thing to do to build a cloud. Where would you go and get that software? Well, there are numerous vendors out there who've been in that business for years. And in general, there have been too many folks saying we can, build, we can do this for you. Ultimately, it's not a defensible technology area. Yeah. You know, it's either being built by the cloud provider or it's, uh, or it's being built by one of the virtualization vendors. And what we decided to do was to collaborate with the folks who are building massively scalable cloud infrastructure because we find ourselves just courtesy of the Zen DNA getting pulled into these massive clouds. So yeah. 10,000 servers is average for us. And um, you know the traditional enterprise management orchestration layer is not going to cut it at that scale. So working with the NASA folks uh, and with Rackspace it was very natural to go towards OpenStack which essentially says we'll open source everything, we'll build this massively scalable distributed object store and distributed orchestration layer that anybody can take combined with any hypervisor and any storage system to build their own cloud. Okay, And that basically should accelerate the adoption of cloud. It will, as a unifier, move much faster. So one of the virtuous benefits of open source, which was true in Zen, was because everybody has rallied around the one thing, it moved much faster than any proprietary code base could because there are multiple routes to market. Right? It also narrows the focus to a l smaller set of APIs so we can learn faster, rev them, get standards done quicker. And, um, and we have commitment on the part of major providers, Rackspace, yep. to, to actually run it. Um, NASA's going to run And it. others. And yeah. others. 25 companies are involved. Right. right and there are numerous vendors rallying around already. And Citrix has stood up and said, look, we'll take this stuff and we'll deliver it to our enterprise customer base as an alternative for the private cloud. Yeah. And um, so it has all of the virtuous properties that open source could ever have, right? Same as we had for Zen. And it, the interesting thing there is that it's the first time that the open source community's really got behind a management, you think of it as management software, a management play in such an energis, en energetic way. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's very, very exciting. What do you think, uh, where do you think the next year is going to see, because I'm seeing a lot of excitement. The yeah, open so OpenStack goes, goes into about, production, or? goes into production in the next year. Yeah. And my goodness, that's fast. I mean, if we had Citrix had sat down and decided to build one, we wouldn't ship it for another two years and it probably wouldn't scale. Right. Okay. So it's fabulous. We'll get this amazing capability set out to market within the next year and have a whole ecosystem aligned around it. So another issue in general with VMware has been, by the way, it's not their fault. They've done a fabulous job and they've been moving fast, but they've moved the ground under the ISV ecosystem incredibly uh, rapidly too. Yeah. And so there isn't a robust ISV ecosystem around VMware. Moreover, they've tried to claim all the ground for themselves, so they're also a security vendor. The benefit of not laying claim to everything is that you leave plenty of room for ISVs to take this and add value. And remember that the cloud area is all about innovation and differentiation. So it's, OpenStack is a starting point for the basic services. Uh, so I think of you know, EC2, S3, EBS type stuff, which is the margarita pizza of cloud, onto which you can then layer additional services to enrich your offering to your customer. And we fully expect a rich set of ISV offerings around that. That's key. Anything else you want to talk about? Tonight? Oh, gosh. And we could go on for hours. This is fun. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. And where do I find you on the web, by the way? Uh, on the web, you can... Uh, Are you on Twitter? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm Simon Crosby on Twitter. Yeah. Simon Crosby. Yeah. And where can we find information about what you what you, what you do at work? Citrix? Oh, uh, well, you can, my blog is at citrix.com slash blogs. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, all my products are at citrix.com. Very cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. And of course, after the camera goes off, we always think about cool things to talk about. Uh, one was the meetup that's coming up, right? The right, OpenStack. so the open, OpenStack is, uh, there's an OpenStack developer meetup in San Antonio mid-November. Yeah, which, I'm going to be there. It's on PlanCast and all. Yeah, I'll we'll have 10 there. people there. And uh, so, I mean, everything we've done for virtual infrastructure for Zen Server, we're just transferring over into OpenStack. So we have our whole crew rally around that and uh, going very fast from our side. We had OpenStack support for Zen Server done between the time that we first met the Rackspace guys and when the plane landed back in the UK. So wow. it was pretty quick. Um, now one of the things which is very important is security. And I am a passionate believer that openness leads to security. 
Okay. Um, that why is, is that? Because it, it, I, I remember why from my work at Microsoft, but tell me why. Well, so open source lets the best people work on those features. It also encourages a better code base. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, um, you know, I'll never say never, but all the years that Amazon has been running Zen, you know, the, the hypervisors never let them down. One of the reasons is that the guys who are best at doing security uh, get to the security modules. And in the case of Zen, we benefit from this contribution of the IBM Secure Hypervisor and then the NSA. Uh, develop the Zen security module. So you don't have to believe me in terms of security, you just have to put it out there and, and, uh, and, and let people kick it around. Um, also then Zen has been independently put through an EAL level 5 cert uh, by a project at the, at the US Naval Research Labs. So that's really important. And by the way, that would transfer up the stack. right? Yeah. But I think one of the fundamental changes that you'll find in the next year or so, next couple of years, is that the traditional notion of enterprise security is rapidly changing. Look, it's nothing more than Moore's law. Um, Moore's law says that there's enough compute that the bad guys can hide themselves quickly enough that you can't detect it. Yeah. And so the traditional notion of having in endpoint uh, attack detection and mitigation is in real trouble. Moreover, if I have lots and lots of workloads on a single server, that just dies very fast. So you'll see uh, very profound changes. One of those is that the hypervisor has an opportunity to assist with what will be the future of enterprise security there, which is to leverage hardware-based trust and attestation. So you leverage root of trust out of the hardware, TXT, to sign the hypervisor. The workload will only run on a known good hypervisor, and the hypervisor will only run a known good workload. Right? So you can test the state of the software stack as and when it starts and indeed in future as it continues to run to check that it is continually within known parameters. You can't say that it's invulnerable, yep. but you can say that that is what isn't you intended to run. Yes. And um, you can take that the whole way up through the software stack. And that's a very, very big change that is coming. We've been partnered with McAfee there in the area of desktop boot. Um, but uh, also we'll be taking all of that forward into sort of just general purpose server virtualization and cloud. Very cool. It's a deep change for the security world, isn't it? It's profound. I'm, I mean, it, there is research out that came out this year that basically proves that it is impossible to detect rapidly changing attacks. Uh, well, thank you Which so means much. it's real. Yeah. Sure. Pleasure.